morning, everyone. Great to see you. Please keep your Bibles open. We're going to look at those uh, verses in a moment. Um, but can I pray for us? Our Father in heaven, uh, we thank you that we can spend this time together now in your word. Um, in the world around us, we've uh, heard and, and seen so many uh, terrible things, whether it's armed conflict, where it, whether it's uh, the death of uh, Australian icons, um, and just the, the continued uh, difficulties in which uh, we live uh, due to the, the pandemic. Uh, so please, God, refresh our hearts and minds today, and please, God, uh, equip us and strengthen us to keep serving uh, you and loving you and your people. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder, are you ever tempted to give up? It's just too hard. You believe God, you trust Jesus, and at the same time, the more you follow Jesus, the harder life seems to get. And sometimes it's like you're looking out through the window and you can see people out there just doing as they like and seemingly enjoying life and they don't need God. I mean, when I follow Jesus, am I missing out? The more I obey God, the more uncomfortable life seems to get and it feels sometimes like my choices and freedoms are being limited. Am I losing out? Well, if you ever feel that way, you are not the first. Uh, there will be times when pretty much every Christian either feels distracted or disappointed or overwhelmed. In the, the verses we're looking at today in 1 Timothy, Paul adopts the language of fighting. The, the language of battle and warfare to describe the Christian life. Now, Timothy is in the city of Ephesus and he's looking after the church. He's right, uh, sorry, Paul's writing to Timothy to encourage and, and equip him. And the language Paul deliberately uses here comes from warfare. It's an analogy that he will use time and time again in the, in the pastoral letters. Now, of course, fighting a battle, that's not the only way to describe the Christian life. The Bible gives us many rich and wide range of metaphors and images that help us understand what it means to follow Jesus. But in this instance, Paul uses this language of warfare. Now, as we start our time together, I just want to ask this question, though. What is this Christian battle? What is the Christian war? In what sense are we engaging in a battle? I mean, are we fighting the culture wars, for example? You know, there's a lot of talk at the moment about cultural issues and, and Christians needing to stand up and protest. Uh, um, is the battle one of making Australia Christian again? Now, of course, as Christians, we sometimes uh, may choose to speak on, on social issues. Perhaps at times it's important to do so. We can love our country and serve by speaking and sharing what we believe. But friends, it is bad theology, though, that tries to make everything the church is into the country or vice versa. Christian nationalism is a heresy because it conflates gospel and church with politics in the state. Well, is the battle we're fighting one of a political election? There are two elections coming up this year. Well, again, a Christian may choose to get involved in politics, and that may be a great way to serve the common good. But, of course, the church belongs to the Lord Jesus, and a church cannot be defined by any political party, and, and neither do we fit neatly into any political ideology. Now, Mento and Baptist belongs to Jesus. We are not liberal or labor or green or whatever else. So what does he mean by a battle? Is the battle a military one? Now, there is a time and place where citizens of a country may join the military to defend the state. I mean, after all, as Christians, we are both citizens of God's kingdom and citizens here on earth. And a citizen here in Australia may join the armed forces in order to serve the country and defend the country. But the church's mission isn't military. Notice how in verse 18, Paul qualifies the language of battle or war with the adjective good. And Paul is making a distinction. This is the good fight. This is the battle which we as a church are engaged in. And the battle is for the faith. 
At stake is the gospel, God's truth. At stake is the, the health and life of the church. And, and that's what Paul is writing to Timothy about, you see. And that point's made really clear. So defining what the war is about is made clear by Paul's use of the word command there in verse 18. He says command or, or charge, as some translations have it. And the command refers back to what Paul was talking about and what we looked at last week in verse 3 and verse 5. So Paul there gives Timothy a command. Don't let certain people teach certain uh, false doctrines in the church. And in verse 5, the goal of the command is love. So when Paul talks about the warfare, it's relating to the command he's already given Timothy about stopping false teaching and teaching what is good. Remember what we saw last week? Not every idea is a good one. Pastors aren't meant to to remain neutral or or sit on the fence on these matters. And so Paul is encouraging Timothy to keep fighting. Now, in in the first place, these verses are written for pastors pastors of a church, those who are leading a a church. Is it like a battle zone? That's what he's suggesting. may not look like a battle zone this morning, but in one sense it is. And at the other, in another sense, all Christians feel pressure. All Christians feel pressure to surrender or negotiate a compromised peace with the world. So in these three verses, what Paul does is give Timothy four resources and strengths to help him fight this war. God is giving us four resources and strengths to help us fight the battle as well. And the first one is this, an encouraging reminder. An encouraging reminder. Look at the the verse uh, 18 with me. Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command. So Paul, again, is reminding Timothy of the job he has been given to do. He's saying, remember why you're there in Ephesus. Remember the work God has given you to do. Remember the responsibilities you have to stop both false doctrine and teaching what is good. You know, the the phrase, the fog of war, you might be familiar with, the fog of war. It speaks about how in the environment of a battle, you can lose a sense of clear judgment. You know, there are so many factors and so many moving pieces. The situation can become foggy and unclear, and sometimes it leads to poor decision making. And that can happen to us as well. We might become distracted or discouraged or defeated. We all at times, don't we, need that that clarifying reminder and encouragement. Friends, this is what we're about. This is one of the, the benefits that comes from meeting regularly together on a Sunday. This is one of the things that we we need regularly, don't we? We need these reminders from God and his word. It's it's one reason why we're here this morning. We gather to to refocus our attention, to recharge our hearts, to reorient ourselves, because so often we forget or we lose heart. So we gather on a Sunday because we need that encouraging reminder. Maybe even during the week, you know, when someone sends you that text message or an email saying, How are you? I'm praying for you. Is there something in particular I can be praying today? We all need those regular reminders saying, hey, this is the gospel. Remember. Remember, we are the people of God. We are loved by God and, and we're serving him together. This is what we're doing at church. So that's the first resource or strength that Paul gives to Timothy. It's an encouraging reminder. Friends, how can you encourage each other this week? Second, he says, remember God's promise and grace. Remember God's promise and grace. So Paul says this to Timothy, in verse 18, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them you may fight the battle well. We don't know exactly what was spoken um, through these prophecies. Uh, We do know that it's tied to Timothy's ordination. So that the event when when Timothy was set aside by the elders of the church to become a preacher and become a pastor. So if you look over in uh, chapter 4, verse 13. Flip over to there for a moment. Verse 13 and 14. That kind of unpacks what this prophecy was about. 
Paul says to Timothy, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. So when Timothy was commissioned by the elders for this task of preaching and teaching, a word of of, of prophecy was given. Again, we're not told exactly what the words were, but the prophecy was given. And so Paul here is again, back in chapter 1, is reminding him of that. Remember that day when God set you apart. Even in Paul's second letter to Timothy, again we'll remind and, and urge Timothy, fan into flame the gift of God, he'll say. So what Paul's doing essentially is drawing on that past, Timothy's past, as a source of encouragement for Timothy now in the present. Because Paul's aware that Timothy was standing before that church in Ephesus. He was preaching a message that was unpopular to the people. People were trying to combat that um, teaching and, and presenting other ideas. And it's hard. It wasn't easy for him. You know, it's hard for Timothy to get up there on a Sunday and to say to people, no, you've got to stop doing that. I mean, for Timothy, you know, often for pastors, you, your income depends on people giving. You know? um, or maybe if you, you know, they'll stop giving if they don't like what you say. They might leave the church. They might go somewhere else. They might start um, gossiping about you, spreading rumors, asking you to leave. In the late 18th century, a 23-year-old preacher was appointed to Holy Trinity Church, Cambridge, England. Now, the only issue was the congregation didn't like him. And they didn't want him. So this is an Anglican church, and so the bishop appointed this guy to become the, the pastor there. Uh, but the congregation said, no, we do not like this dude. I don't think they said dude in the 18th century. But anyway, you get the point. Anyway, they, and they started a campaign to get rid of him. One of the early things they did was to padlock the pews. They were an old church building. You could, put, you could lock the pews so you couldn't get in. And so no one could sit down for church. So if you wanted to turn up, you had to stand in the middle of the aisle. And they thought, well, that, that, that'll be a winner. That'll stop it. So what uh, the preacher did, uh, his name was Charles Simeon. He brought in chairs for people to sit in along the aisles. Yeah, And so church members came in and then they grabbed hold of these chairs and they threw them outside. Don't get any ideas. And and for years this went on. This is not like, oh, your first Sunday and people get over it. This just went on and on and on. The local university students would taunt him when he arrived for church and when he left. At times they would come in and interrupt the service by going on about all kinds of stuff. For the first 12 years, and when the evening service was run, the congregation would not let him preach. They would not let their own pastor preach. Every week they would pay someone to come in and do the job instead. Charles Simeon said at one time, I used to sail in the Pacific. I'm now learning to navigate the Red Sea that is full of shoals and rocks. Which is a bit of an imagery you can imagine from 1 Timothy that we could look at. That idea of being shipwrecked. So Paul's reminding Timothy here. Yeah, things are difficult. It is not easy to exercise your ministry in Ephesus. So remember God's promises. Remember God's grace to you. Remember when you started out working and being a servant of God's word. And even for us, when you're sensing temptation, and you just maybe I just I feel like packing it in, just giving up on church. I don't really like the people. They're not easy to get along with. I, there's some stuff that annoys me. I'm just going to give it in, give it up. Or when you're feeling pressure to conform and therefore change God's good words, again, go back to first principles. Remember God's grace to you in the Lord Jesus. Remember how in God's amazing love, he has called you to himself. He's called us to be holy. He's called us to be his people. Remember those things. Remember perhaps your baptism, the day when you confessed your faith in the Lord Jesus. Remember the day you joined the church and you made a commitment before God to his people. Remember the time you agreed to serve in in kids ministry or you agreed to meet up with somebody. Whatever it is, in all the the different ways that God gives us grace to, to serve and love his people. 
Friends, continue to draw on that grace to keep fighting that good fight. To fight against sin in your life. To keep fighting against the noisy but empty promises of the world around us. And to keep fighting for each other. A third strength that Paul uh, mentions here, it's there in verse 19, it's holding on to faith. This third resource that we need to fight the good fight, it is to hold on to faith. So Paul doesn't mean just hope. He's not saying that. Just stick out your hands and just hope for the best. That's not the, the picture here. By faith, Paul may be referring to the act of faith. So it is, he's saying keep trusting Jesus. Keep trusting the sufficiency and truthfulness of the Bible. Now that's true. But Paul also may be saying, by holding on to faith, he's saying, he's talking about sorry, the, the object of our faith. So it is the gospel itself that will keep us persevering. So if you're sitting in a, in a right, uh, life raft and say there's, there are flood rare, uh, waters all around you, surrounding you, you're, you're safe by staying in the boat, you see. So you have faith in, in the boat, but it's the boat itself which is protecting you from, from the flood waters and from drowning. And so the image here, the instruction here may be, hold on to Christ. And friends, he will never let us go. To keep fighting the good fight, keep trusting in Jesus, but also understand it is his gospel that will keep us going. And then the fourth strength that Paul mentions here is a good conscience. A good conscience. Now, our conscience is not a perfect guide. Uh, The Bible talks about how the conscience can be uh, squashed. It can be tainted by sin. The conscience can mislead us. That's all true. But it's also the case that the conscience, which has been cleansed by by God through the the gospel, that conscience is being made new. And and as it's made new, it does become an inner guide that helps us understand how we are going. So as the, the gospel is pervading our lives, like the conscience, what it should happen, it becomes more alert, it becomes more attentive to the things of God and informs us whether we are obeying God, God, and it shows us, are we trusting Jesus or not? Because a good conscience is one that is informed by God's ways and agrees with God's ways. It's like an alarm system that goes off in our heads from, from time to time, Okay. If you've got an alarm system at home and it goes off, uh, it's, it's a warning, isn't it? It's bringing something to your attention which demands your attention, right? And you think maybe something's up at home. Now, it could be just that your pet dog has, I don't know, taken an unauthorized adventure to one of the bedrooms. Uh, maybe it's the, the wind shaking the, the windows, or maybe it's an intruder. And so you investigate. See, when our conscience alarms, we need to take note. We should listen up. Am I listening to my conscience, which I know is seeking first God and is joyfully submitting to God's word? Or am I going to sit in silence and just ignore it? The more our lives are aligned with Jesus, the more reliable the conscience is going to become as, as a source to set off that alarm, you see. Paul says, keep a good conscience. So to fight the Christian life well, we need a good conscience. We need all of those resources, those God-given strengths, that, those words of encouragement and reminder. That looking back to God's uh, promises and grace in our life, that resolve to keep trusting Jesus no matter, matter how hard it is, and that conscience, which is like a safeguard, it's an alarm system that's warning us when we're turning away from the path. The uh, young adults group on Tuesday night were talking about the film uh, Fight Club. Which is a bit of a like a cult movie, which you know it was very popular. What twenty? I mean, most of these kids were never weren't even born when the movie was made. But uh, and I think most of them haven't even seen the film. But people know the famous lines from Fight Club. You know, rule number one: you don't talk about Fight Club. Rule number two: yeah, the second rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. Now, I suspect 
these days, we don't talk about the Christian life much in terms of a fight, do we? Or of a battle. It's not one of the images that perhaps we're, we're drawn to or can, can connect with particularly, and so we just leave it out. But friends, it is a biblical image, and therefore it is one that God has given us to help us understand the Christian life. The Christian life is a fight. It's not a physical fight. Now, it's far harder than that. It's not a political fight. It has far greater consequences than any election. This is the fight of the universe against sin and evil and death. Now, governments and laws and education may provide a little protection against some of these things, but it is only the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection that ultimately will defeat death and sin and evil. No government can do that for us. No legal system can achieve that. No one else has died in our place for our sin. You know, Jesus said to Peter one day how the keys of Hades had been given or will be given to the church. The Bible talks about how God's power of salvation creates the church. And that we now, as God's people, are holding on to that hope. That we might persevere, and that others might hear and believe. Now, that's hard work. If a military war is hard, if a political war is hard, I mean, imagine how hard it is to fight for the universe. It's hard work because Satan opposes God's work. The world opposes Jesus. Our own sinfulness undermines the gospel. You know, and I suspect if I asked for a show of hands, we won't, but if, if I did and, and asked, do you find it hard to accept parts of the Bible? Or some, some other teachings of scripture. I'm sure many hands will go up. If I asked, do you find it just difficult to keep trusting Jesus? Because everyone else seems to have life so easy. And why is it harder for me? And you begin to question and to wonder. When there are so many other great things we could be doing on a Sunday morning. I could be playing golf. No, I don't like golf. I could be, I could be playing sport of some description. I could, I could be sleeping in. There's so much else I could be doing. And, and yet, you know, that, that, that pressure and that pull. And, and yet, should I be here together with God's people? If I ask you, you ever feel that pressure? I'm sure many will put their hands up. It's a hard fight because of peer pressure. It's a hard fight because our society is always teaching us something else. It's hard because I have to deal with my own sinful heart. It's hard because sometimes it feels like you're in a boxing ring and, and all these intellectual heavyweights are coming up with these sophisticated arguments about why we're wrong or moral arguments about why Christians are wrong and you just feel ill-equipped to go fight back. And it's hard because there is a cost, isn't there? There's a cost. If I believe what God says about marriage and sex, then I might lose my friends. I could lose my job now. There is a cost. There's a cost attached. Paul says to Timothy, and I'm saying to you today, do not give up. Don't give in. But in verses 19 and 20, we see that some people do. This is an example of some who do give up the fight. We read, Some have rejected and have so suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. It's a pretty vivid image, isn't it? Imagine wild conditions at sea. You've got the wind and the, and the waves are battering the boat on the sides of the boat. And maybe someone decides to cut the engine. They just stop fighting. They give up and just allow the waves to push them onto the rocks. Maybe you saw that footage during the week of the, of the floods in Queensland. There were boats who were losing their mooring in the, in the river. And they were just crashing into the, the side of the riverbank or into the pier and, and, that, and sinking. 
Paul is saying that there are people in churches who are doing that. They've crashed the faith. They've broken apart. You know, it's one thing for us to start a race, but the aim's to finish it well, isn't it? There are plenty of people who at one point in their life have said, I am a Christian, I follow Jesus. And maybe they were baptized. Maybe they joined a church as well. But then a few years later, they're not at church anymore. They drift. And eventually we don't see them again. And maybe they don't even identify as a Christian at all. And we, it happens. We, we know people in that situation. We've seen it here at Mentone. Not a lot, but each and every time it is profoundly sad. There is no joy in seeing someone make up their mind, I do not believe anymore. Paul names two people here, doesn't he? Two men. There's no silent tiptoeing away. Uh, These two names are probably among the the, the chief architects who were responsible for the problems in that church and for the the false teaching that was going on, uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander. Paul mentions them again in his next letter. In 2 Timothy, he says, Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. And in chapter 4 of uh, 2 Timothy, Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. Now, when verse 20 talks about handing people over to Satan, now that phrase is a pretty scary one, isn't it? To be handing someone over to Satan. I think on view here is church discipline. And most commentators uh, believe that's what's going on here. It's a case of church discipline. Whether a church member is caught up in in sin or they are teaching a falsehood and they want to keep pursuing that path and they don't repent, eventually they are removed from fellowship. So you see, outside the domain of Christ is the domain of, of the evil one. So outside the church is the domain of Satan. And so to hand someone over to Satan is to exercise church discipline, remove them from membership and fellowship. And that tells us how big a deal it is to be part of a church. This church community, it's not like a men's shed where you just come and go as you like if you've got a project you want to work on. You know, or it's not like a local sporting club where you just participate whenever, you know, whenever you're in season and you're in the mood for it. Or it's not a hospital that you visit only when you're sick. The church is God's people who are joined together for the sake of Christ. And to remove someone from fellowship is to hand them over to the evil one. I think it also shows us how that church discipline, when it is undertaken, it must be done with considerable care and prayer and humility. It's not a weapon to use against people. It's not a weapon to bring out against someone that you don't like or who's kind of difficult. There is a great weight to this task. And it should only be exercised with wisdom and with a desire that those who are being disciplined will wake up and come back to Jesus. But there's also a warning there, isn't there? Don't become like Hymenaeus and Alexander. Friends, if that is describing you, wake up and turn back to God. So Paul here in these few verses is talking about a battle as a war. What does winning look like, though? What does winning look like? What's the description? Is it, uh, I don't know, getting a trophy, uh, gold medal, a championship? Is it winning the, the political election? It's, is it overturning an unjust law? Is it securing a lucrative deal? What does winning look like in the Christian life? But did you notice in these verses, Paul doesn't promise a triumph. God doesn't promise that we're going to win a culture war. He doesn't promise ministry success. He doesn't promise that the church is going to grow exponentially every year. He doesn't promise that everything we even pray for that we will receive. 
I mean, many faithful churches in history have been destroyed. Many a faithful Christian has been laid down by sickness, and some of our own number have. Many a faithful Christian have been laid down by betrayal or unemployment or disaster. You might fight faithfully and have people accuse you of all kinds of wrongdoing and spread rumors about you and destroy your reputation. God is not promising us some easy or cheap victory here. And notice when we fight, we fight. It's not primarily for ourselves, but it's for the sake of the church. For Jesus' sake. You know, when you, you listen to interviews with soldiers who have fought in wars and you're reading biographies of, of these military men and women, so often you hear that one of the main reasons why they kept fighting, that they kept going, despite the opposition and despite all the, the fear that they were experiencing, it's because they didn't want to let their mates down. The sense of camaraderie is so big. Soldiers are prepared to push forward and persevere and to stand by their friends no matter the cost. And that's what's going on here in Ephesus. Paul is urging Timothy to keep fighting, stay there for the sake of the people who are there. We need to keep challenging that individualistic filter in which we view our life. Instead, to consider, no, I am here and I am serving and I'm belonging because I love the Lord Jesus and I love his people. Friends, encourage one another in the Lord. Remember God's grace to you. Keep trusting Jesus and listen to your conscience as God's spirit is at work in your life. Do all those things. God is not promising you, though, an easy life. He is not saying that you can retire with ease. He's not saying that church is going to be a stress-free zone. But God's word is saying, don't give up. Don't give in. And one day the battle will end. One day the war of the world will end. At the end of his second letter to Timothy, Paul says this. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Friends, wait for that day which is coming. But today, don't give up the fight. Don't give up believing what the Bible says. Don't give up godliness. Don't give up church. But ask for help, for encouragement, for strength. I wonder, what is your strategy for fighting this coming week? Have you given it some thought? Where do you feel weak at the moment? Where do you sense you're you're vulnerable? Friends, you need a game plan. We need a game plan. Can I encourage you to share that with someone uh, this week, even today? Talk to God about it. And if you are someone who is drifting, ask God to help you. Repent. Repent. Confess your sin to him. Ask for his forgiveness. Ask him to restore you. Let us pray, shall we? Father, we do thank you for this word where you describe for us the Christian life as one being that of a fight. It is a war. Uh, It is the war of the world where we in rebellion against you have rejected you and your ways and where you with extraordinary love and grace and mercy have pursued us and where your son gave his life on the cross for us. Father, we pray that you might help us to keep fighting the good fight this week. Please, God, resource us and strengthen us 
that together we might fight this fight for our good, for the good of the church and for your glory. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.